Hello, this video is part of a series on the new Cajun model and its implementation in Dynair. In this particular video, I will show you how to compute optimal policy in Dynair. So we will talk about real and nominal distortions that lead to an inefficient allocation and that open up space for policy measures that improve the welfare of the agents. Now in the baseline model, we will talk about the so-called divine coincidence. That is how optimal policy can achieve both price stability and the efficient and natural allocation. However, in practice, there are many more rigidities and typically policymakers face trade-offs and uncertainties. So we will talk about concepts of optimal policy under discretion and commitment, but also about simple implementable rules. Lastly, I will also go through how you can compare different policy regimes to each other. As usual, I'd like to give you some perspective on the theory behind these concepts without getting lost in the details, because the focus on this video is really on the implementation in Dynair. If you want to study this more in detail, please refer to chapters four and five of Galis textbook and the Dynair implementation is heavily based on work by Johannes Pfeiffer. There are timestamps in the description of the video, so please feel free to skip ahead. If you find this video useful or if you spot any mistakes, please leave your comments below so I can update the description. Lastly, before we start, also check out my blog on more stuff uh, regarding these G models and Dynair. So let's go. So in general, we want policymakers to be good. That is to do all they can to increase the welfare and ideally, of course, the welfare of households. Now, characterizing optimal behavior, so say whether or not a central bank or a fiscal authority really behaves optimally, requires a framework to think about this. Okay, and here, these G models, like the new Keynesian uh, model, um, are particularly useful as they provide an analytical framework to think about these issues. So basically we have, or having this model, we have a laboratory. So we can compare different policy rules or regimes. Uh, we can compute optimal policies based on maximizing some, uh, say, utility function or minimizing some loss function. And also we can quantify those welfare gains or losses of um, different policies or even different instruments. So let's have a look at the basic new Keynesian model. And here we have two kinds of distortions or inefficiencies. Um, first, we have market power due to monopolistically competitive firms. That is, firms are able to charge a markup on marginal costs. And this implies, of course, a real wage that is too high and not equal to the marginal product of labor. And as this wage is too high, of course, employment is too low and so is output. So the first inefficiency is basically due to market power. The second distortion in the model is price stickiness. Okay, so having, for instance, the Calvo framework, uh, we have relative price distortions between firms that reset their price and firms that are not allowed to reset the price or to re-optimize. Um, if you work with the Rotenberg model, you of course have those uh, price distortions due to the quadratic price adjustment costs for firms that want to reset. An efficient allocation that is one under flexible prices would imply that those quantities produced and those quantities consumed are all equal. So we have a symmetric problem and they should be equalized. So in other words, prices and marginal costs are also equalized and that is we have basically price stability. Now, so the second inefficiency is due to those nominal rigidities. And the appeal of the canonical New Keynesian model is its analytical tractability. So we can quantify these inefficiencies um, based on a bunch of parameters. We can, we, we actually know or we can derive the optimal allocation. Uh, what does it look like? So that would be one where these two distortions are offset. So there is perfect competition and flexible prices. But the question remains, how do we get this optimal allocation? So how do we convince the firms that they charge prices equal to marginal costs? Even though they have the power to charge markups, uh, maybe we can convince them to um, charge prices such that they are equal to marginal costs. And of course, how do we convince firms to not adjust prices ever? 
Now, let's briefly talk about two concepts important to offset these two uh, distortions. First, efficient output, that is the output level under perfect competition. Okay, here the focus is on an allocation without real rigidities, such as market power. The second one is the natural output, that is output under flexible prices, but possibly with real rigidities, such as market power. Here the focus is on an allocation without nominal rigidities. So this is also sometimes called the flex price allocation. And these are structural concepts. So basically, for instance, monetary policy cannot influence the level of the, of the efficient or the natural level of output, but they can help achieve, help to get this level. Now let's think about how policymakers can actually achieve this allocation. And this is what we then call optimal policy. So first, the fiscal authority can actually offset the market power by introducing a, a wage subsidy and such that the, the subsidized wage is actually lower. And then firms, in effect, charge um, a price that is equal to marginal costs. And when this uh, subsidy is financed by lump sum taxes, this does not introduce any other distortions into the model. Now, second, monetary policy should do what it can to fully stabilize the price level so that firms don't ever see the need to adjust their prices and then we don't have any relative price distortions. So in sum, even though firms have market power, the employment subsidy offsets this, okay, when we get efficient allocation. And second, even though there are nominal rigidities, the central bank stabilizes the price level and marginal costs at the flex price allocation. So here we can actually achieve both, okay? The efficient and simultaneously also the natural output allocation. So even though we have those distortions in the model, the allocation that we get is the same as in the model without these distortions. And this is due to optimal policy. Now the central bank only stabilizes prices, but what about output? Wouldn't it be also good if the central bank achieves a constant level of output? And here the, the answer is no. I mean, the, the whole literature on the RBC model has taught us that there are many shocks, many so-called real shocks, like TFP or preference shocks, that are responsible for variations in the natural level of output. And what we want to achieve is that our output in the model behaves exactly like the natural or here also the efficient level of output. So it does the same fluctuations because these are first best. Now let's assume that we have a subsidy that offsets market power and that is equal to the inverse of the demand um, of elasticity of goods. Now let's have a look at the um, log linearized New Keynesian model, which basically consists of the New Keynesian Phillips curve and the dynamic IS curve. And again, the optimal allocation is that output behaves exactly or should behave exactly like the natural or efficient output. So the output gap um, is always zero and the central bank stabilizes prices. So inflation is actually also zero. Now, if you have a look at these equations, you can see that when pi is equal to zero in the first equation, automatically the output gap is zero. And this will then have in the second equation, this implies automatically that the nominal interest rate is equal to the natural rate. So this means that the natural or efficient level of output is basically a byproduct of price stability. And this is what we call the divine coincidence. Okay, the central bank can achieve both price stability and a natural and efficient output level. So how does the central bank do so? We know that the central bank basically sets the nominal interest rate. So why not just set it to the desired equilibrium, that is to the natural rate, interest rate? And here we can then analytically show in this very small scale uh, log linearized New Keynesian model that the equilibrium dynamics would imply indeterminacy because we have one eigenvalue that is larger than one. 
Um, what does that mean? Basically, this means there's not a unique solution here, but there are multiple equilibria for the output gap and inflation. And this is actually in contrast to the optimal allocation that features uniqueness and determinacy. This is not a desired outcome. Let's see how we can do this in Dynair. Okay, here I have the basic log linearized new Keynesian DSG model. Okay, we have technology process, we have a preference shock process, we have consumption, uh, we have output, we have the natural level of output, we have the output gap, the natural um, interest rate, we have the real interest rate, we have the nominal interest rate, inflation, the hours worked, and the real wage. Note that these variables are all log deviations from their steady state level. Okay, we have a TFP shock and a preference shock. We have a bunch of parameters and we do, we have to think about monetary policy rule. So I have included here two parameters that will give me feedback or not, um, depending on this monpol variable. So the model is a linear model. So we can make the computations faster by also including the linear here. Um, there are a bunch of composite parameters. There's the new Keynesian Phillips curve. There is the dynamic IS curve. Uh, also in include the log linearized production function, the log linearized equation for labor demand, um, for the market clearing condition. Uh, here's the TFP and the preference shifter processes, um, the definition of the natural rate of interest. So this is basically coming from a model without market power and with, that, with flexible prices. Um, then there's the definition of the real interest rate. This is basically the Fisher equation. Um, the natural output again from the flex price model without market power. And the output gap is this. And then I'm having a look at now first this rule here. So I'm, I will set monpole equal to one in a second. Okay, so this is the exogenous one to one rule here. And there are two shocks in the model. So, and I set just for illustrations there, variance to one. Okay, let me save this as new Keynesian linear common dot ink because this is a common uh, model equations which I will do use for my other rules as well. Okay, now let's uh, have a look at the exogenous one for one rule. Okay, so we define this macro variable to one. I'm including this model equations and I'm setting the parameters right here computing the steady and let's try to get um, uh, pulse response functions here. Let me call this and we get an error. Okay, the Blanchard and Kahn conditions are not satisfied. So this is indeterminacy. And there's a command called check which you can also simply run, which will then compute those eigenvalues and will tell you whether or not the order or rank condition of Blanchard and Kahn are uh, verified or not. Okay, so here the rank condition isn't verified, we have indeterminacy. Okay, so this is not a desired outcome. So let's consider a different rule, a um, interest rate rule with feedback to the target variable. And I do want to achieve that the interest rate, the nominal interest rate is equal to the natural rate. Now, having a look at the equilibrium dynamic in closed form, and one can show that a unique and a determinate solution is when the chosen values of the parameters fulfills this inequality. And whenever the feedback parameter on inflation deviations is greater than one, then the model always ensures uniqueness and determinacy. So in other words, the, the, the presence of a strong response, a more than one for one response to an eventual deviation of inflation from its target is already sufficient to rule out any indeterminate solution. So the, this Taylor principle prevents the emergence of multiple equilibria and this is a desirable feature of any interest rate rule. We want a unique and determinate solution. Again, let's have a look in Dynair whether we get the same response here.
Okay, so let's have a look at these, this optimal rule with feedback to the target variables. Okay, so this is when I'm setting monpol equals to two. I'm using this inter, uh, monetary policy rule. That is, it always follows the natural interest rate, but if inflation or the output gap deviate from their target uh, values, then there's a threat that the central bank will strongly react to it more than one to one. So if this parameter is larger than one. Okay, now let's do this. Okay, we define this variable as two, include the model equations, um, have the same parameterization, but now I'm also setting some values here for the monetary policy rule, computing the steady, and let's first compute the check command. And the rank condition is verified. Okay, so we can then go ahead and also compute IRFs. So, and what we can see is that the output level, the reaction to a TFP shock, is exactly the same as the natural output level behaves. Okay, and the same for the um, interest rate. Okay, so the nominal interest rate behaves exactly the same as the natural rate. And the same here for a preference shock on the discount factor. Okay, so the nominal interest rate behaves exactly the same as the natural interest rate. And we have price stability, so the real rate is, of course, also the same. So optimal policy, we have divine coincidence here, okay? And we can see this, that also in here. Have a look at the theoretical moments, for instance, of Y and the natural level of output. They're exactly the same, so they behave exactly the same. And the output gap is stabilized, okay? It's always zero. There's no um, variation in here. And the same for the natural interest rate and the nominal interest rate, okay? They beha behave exactly the same and prices are fully stabilized. Now, I want to show you something else to, to see the, the region, the determinacy region and the unique uh, solution region. There's also a toolbox in Dynair, which is very powerful, but I, I will just show you a very small thing of this to toolbox, the so-called Dynair sensitivity toolbox. And for this, we have to tell Dynair which parameters are we interested in to see whether or not we have a unique solution or not, whether we have a determinate solution or an indeterminate one. And I'm just focusing on the monetary policy rules, um, providing an, an so-called estimated params block, which you also need if you try to estimate your model parameters. But this basically tells you this is an in initial value, this is a lower bound, and this is an upper bound. And what the toolbox will do, it will randomly um, draw from um, from these bounds here and compute the solution here, okay? And um, then it will count how many times you get a unique solution, how many times you get a uh, determinate solution, and it will give you some um, some insight, uh, insights here. The sen sensitivity toolbox also requires observable variables, um, but here this is not really important. You can ba basically assume that all variables are observable and then it's just calling Dynair sensitivity. And what you see is here, uh, by default, it's drawing 2048 different combinations of phi pi and phi y, computing the solution, uh, checking the blanchard kahn conditions and then um, once this finishes, we get a bit of output in the terminal here and also two graphs. Okay, let's first have a look at the graphs. Okay, so this is the parameter driving non-existence of unique stable solution. Okay, and here the toolbox identifies only one parameter, phi pi, and these are uh, CDF functions, cumulative distribution functions. Okay, so basically whenever the parameter phi pi is below uh, 0 0.9, say okay, and whenever the value here, you always have a, you don't have a unique 
um, stable solution here. Okay, so when it starts growing, there are some combinations for phi pi below one, because we have phi y is non-zero, that will also give you a unique stable cell path, but it actually really starts when phi pi is above one, that all those values will give you a unique solution. And the same is for indeterminacy. Okay, so this is the same picture. So there are some combinations of parameters that give you a determinate solution here, but really only when it starts to uh, be above one, then all the uh, parameter values will give you a determinate solution. You can actually see this when, let me set phi y to zero and let me just uncomment this. Okay, so here you really have this, the blue one is no indeterminacy, it really starts at one, okay? And the same for uh, unique stable solution, it really also starts at one. So this is the Taylor principle. But even if we allow for feedback to the output gap, whenever phi pi is above one, then all those um, parameter values will give you a unique, a determinate solution. So this is the Taylor principle. Now let's have a, a look here in the terminal. Um, we have so-called, let me see. Okay, so there are some, some summary statistics of the sensitivity toolbox. And basically here, if you run this sensitivity toolbox with more parameters, you will get a um, statistic which parameters are most important for driving the uniqueness or the indeterminacy of your model and for us this is just phi pi okay the lesson we've learned here is that we have divine coincidence okay the central bank targets price stability there is a optimal simple rule where we can have that output behaves exactly like the natural output and the interest rate behaves exactly like the natural interest rate. Okay, so we have seen that this optimal rule give you, gives you a unique and determinate solution and this is a desirable feature here of this rule. Now in reality we don't see the divine coincidence and this is of course due to the fact that there are many more sources of uncertainty and other frictions that disturb the uh, macroeconomic policy rules. So typically policymakers face a trade-off, at least in the short run, between price stability and the attainment of an efficient uh, level of economic activity. So they don't like variations of inflation from their target, but they also try to minimize vari variability in the output gap. And say the ECB or in particular the Federal Reserve um, they do not claim to stabilize inflation completely month to month, but they allow for some inflationary pressure, uh, in the short run at least, to stabilize uh, output fluctuations. And this is then what they call, uh, or this is why they call their inflation target a medium term target. So some call this behavior of uh, the uh, ECB and particularly the Federal Reserve uh, flexible inflation targeting. So this is the actual monetary policy problem we are concerned about. Okay, so what is the objective in this case? Uh, what is the optimal and efficient allocation, the, the so-called first best, and is it actually achievable? Or is there maybe another allocation, say a second best, that policymakers can do to, to minimize some, some loss function or to, to maximize welfare? And in the following, I would like to focus particularly on two cases um, how committed are policymakers to their plans? So um, do they lay out their plans today and promise to follow this rule and they keep their promise? So, so agents actually anticipate this behavior and they anticipate it correctly? Or are policymakers under discretion, that is they are not bound to keep any promises and they basically solve a static optimization problem. So each period they decide what to optimally do uh, given their objective. So let us break this divine coincidence. Okay, again, remember there's an efficient level of output and a natural level of output. 
And when we introduce real frictions into the model and we have both nominal and real rigidities, this breaks this divine coincidence because the, the, the flex parse allocation is not efficient anymore and this is not optimal to target. Okay, so when nominal rigidities coexist with real imperfections, the flexible price equilibrium allocation is generally inefficient. And this is no longer optimal for the central bank to replicate this uh, allocation. So we, in a sense, we do have sh at least short run deviations from the efficient and the natural level of output and uh, also from the actual level of output. Okay, now let's first assume there are say short run deviations between the natural level of output and the efficient level of output. And let's assume this gap, call, let's call this U, um, that it follows a stationary process with zero mean that implies basically that the steady state is sufficient. And this U is often called a cost push shock in the literature. Now remember, monetary policy cannot really influence the efficient or the natural level of output, but here it now really faces a policy trade-off. Okay, let's have a look at the non-policy block. So we see the impossibility of simultaneously achieving a price stability and that the welfare relevant output gap X becomes zero. Okay, and this welfare relevant output gap is um, the deviation from actual output from its efficient level. Now, one can do um, a second order approximation to the utility or of the utility function of the household to show that welfare losses are given by this equation here. And the derivation here is a bit involved and not uh, very important for this video. But if we have a close look to this equation, um, this is actually the objective function of the central bank, okay? It wants to minimize these losses. And if you have again a close look to this equation, the steady state of pi and the steady state of x, they are both zero. So we look here at second product moments with mean zero. So basically what we do or what we want to do is to minimize variances. Okay, so the central bank wants to minimize this loss. They don't, they want to minimize vari variability of the inflation. Um, but also to minimize the variability of the output gap. This parameter at the welfare relevant output gap can be shown that this is the ratio between kappa and epsilon, so basically between the New Keynesian Phillips curve and the, uh, which is a composite parameter of price uh, rigidities, and epsilon is the elasticity of substitution between goods, so this measures market power. And mathematically, this is a so-called linear quadratic problem because our model equations here are linearized, but the objective we want to solve is a quadratic one. Now let's have a closer look at this Ramsey problem and also in more general terms. This is not only for monetary policy, but for any kind of policy. The idea is always to maximize an objective function, a welfare function, the utility of households, um, or to minimize a loss function. And a planner chooses variables, those are the so-called instruments, to maximize or welfare or minimize the loss here. Always subject to the model dynamics given by the equilibrium equations of your model. And mathematically, we then solve a, a system of first order conditions for the endogenous variables, the Lagrange multipliers of the social planner's problem, um, the policy instruments uh, that the planner chooses optimally, and uh, initial conditions. And then we can, for instance, linearize the system and do all sorts of uh, computations like compute impulse response functions to a shock given optimal policy behavior in a sense that we maximize welfare or we have minimized the loss. Now, when actually implementing this, for instance, in Dynair, there's usually one major difficulty that we run into. Um, we need to adapt our steady state computations uh, to be conditional on the values of the instruments in the optimal policy problem. And we also need to provide, of course, good initial values for this. And often this also requires to um, do a clever steady state computation. Sometimes we need to update parameters that influence the objective here. 
Uh, so those are basically endogenous parameters. And in Dynair, you can do that either in the steady state model block or in the steady state file. So let's first have a look at optimal policy under commitment. We have our loss function that we want to minimize. That is the sum of the variance of inflation plus the variance of the output gap. And this var phi here is a relative weight we put on the output gap. And we do this minimization not only for this period, but also for future periods that we discount by the discount factor beta. Um, subject to the model equations, the equilibrium conditions of our uh, model, these need of course to be uh, fulfilled as well. And mathematically speaking, we would then set up the Lagrangian, uh, get the first order conditions with respect to our uh, instruments, and also taking into account those Lagrange multipliers for the uh, equilibrium conditions. Okay, now let's have a look at how to do this in Dynair. What are the commands? Now first, there is a so-called planner objective block where you declare the one period, not lifetime, but one period objective function. And in our case, this would be the period loss function. Now for um, optimal policy under commitment, this expression can actually be any even nonlinear expression. For optimal policy under discretion, we will see that this then can be only quadratic, that is in terms of variances. Now then, um, we need to call Ramsey model. And this instructs Dynair to create the expanded model with all the Lagrange multipliers, with all those first order conditions um, with respect also to the Lagrange multipliers. It does not perform any computations, uh, so it needs to be then followed by, by some instruction like uh, steady to compute the steady state value of the Ramsey economy or to Stoxemo with uh, various approximations orders to conduct stochastic simulations uh, based on perturbation solutions or uh, to estimations so you can estimate model parameters under optimal policy with commitment um, or do, um, I don't know, perfect foresight um, simulations. Now there are some options uh, to Ramsey model for instance, the planner discount, uh, this is the discount factor of lifetime utility. So in our case, this would be uh, the beta. Uh, and very importantly, the instruments. And here choosing the instruments is partly a, a matter of interpretation. And you can or you should choose instruments that are handy from a mathematical point of view. Um, and a typical example in our case is, of course, uh, inflation um, or the nominal interest rate as an instrument here. Um, you can also do Ramsey constraints, uh, that is, for instance, you want the nominal interest rate to be uh, positive, so you have non-negativity constraints. Then there is evaluate planner objective. This basically computes, displays and stores the value of the planner objective under Ramsey policy in the OO underscore structure, given the initial val values of the endogenous state variables. And then there is, lastly, there's also Ramsey policy, which is basically a shorthand for calling Ramsey models, Stoxemo um, at order one, and the evaluate planner objective function. So this computes the first order approximation of the policy that maximizes the policymaker's objective functions, subject to the constraints uh, provided by the equilibrium equations and under commitment, okay? And the Ramsey policy is then computed by uh, approximating the equilibrium system around the perturbation point where the Lagrange multipliers are at their steady state. And maybe a quick note, um, the first order approximation to the optimal policy in, in Dynair is not to be confused with a uh, naive linear quadratic approach to optimality that uh, the, the literature has found to lead to superior welfare rankings. So um, in that case, uh, the optimal policy would be computed subject to the first order approximated first order conditions. But here, we, Dynair actually computes the first order conditions of the Ramsey planners problem subject to the nonlinear constraints, okay? So there is no approximation happening yet, but it then approximates those first order conditions of the planners problem to first order. So there will be um, say second order terms that are required for second order correct welfare evaluation. Okay, now let's uh, have a look how to do this in Dynair. 
So let us now first introduce the cost push shock into the new Keynesian log linearized model. So I will have two more definitions of output. That is the efficient output and the welfare relevant output gap and the efficient real interest rate instead of the natural interest rate here. Let's also introduce a shock that is the cost push shock and there will be a cost push process here. This is what I'm ca gonna call U. So I'm I don't want to consider any more simple rules here so I don't need the monetary policy parameters. Those composite parameters I don't want them to have in here. Uh, for the model equations I'm actually only needing this psi y a but I will update the other ones in the steady state block. So the new Keynesian Phillips curve now is dependent on the welfare relevant output gap plus this cost push process. The dynamic IS curve here is now dependent on the efficient interest rate, okay, and uh, for the welfare relevant output gap. The production function stays the same, the labor demand equation stays the same, the resource constraint is the same, the TFP process, same, preference shifter is the same. Now then we have the definition of natural interest rate. This will then actually become a definition of the efficient interest rate. Okay, so this is given by this equation. We have a definition for the real interest rate and then we have definition of natural output, but this is now actually efficient output. Okay, because in steady state, of course, they are, this, uh, they are both the same. Then we have the definition of the output gap. That is fine. And I'm adding a couple of more equation, linking various output gaps to each other and the implicit definition of the natural output. Okay, so this is the definition of U and we need a law of motion for U. There you go. I don't have any monetary policy rule here anymore and let me delete this here as well. Okay, so let's save this as a new file, common.inc. Okay, and now let's do the optimal policy under commitment case. So let's include the uh, model equations. I'm just focusing here on the cost push shock. Let's use the same calibration. And now let's first consider a transitory cost push shock under commitment, uh, measuring this by the persistence parameter rho u, which we probably need to introduce as a parameter as well. Okay. Okay, let's save this as new. So let us now declare the planner objective, which is Pi, the, the period objective function. So this is pi squared plus the var theta times the welfare relevant output gap squared. Of course, I still have to define the var theta as a parameter. So I have to go back in here. And actually what var theta depends also on kappa. So I have to include those two parameters here. I'm not using local var parameters here anymore but I'm using this to evaluate an objective function, so I'm actually um, declaring this as actual parameters. Okay, but I have to compute the values here, and what I'm gonna do is I am going to compute this in a steady state model block. Okay, so this is basically kappa, and this is kappa divided by epsilon, which is the, the weight given to the output gap and the loss functions. All other variables have a steady state of zero. Now, this is my planner objective, and now I'm setting up the Ramsey model, giving my instrument, well, there's monetary policy, there's basically just one instrument, the nominal interest rate, and the planner discount factor is beta. And then I want to do uh, impulse response functions. And let's just focus on those three variables. 
and let us also evaluate the planner objective function. So let's see. And I get my impulse response functions under optimal policy, under commitment. And we will uh, discuss these uh, in a second when we cover also question in every case. So you also have the approximated value of the planner objective function right over here. And in the OO underscore structure, you do have this planner objective, which you then can access. You can also do a response to a persistent cost push shock. So let's change the parameter row u to a high persistence value. And then let's redo the stock um, simul command and evaluate the planner objective. Le on the left hand side, you have the transitory cost push shock. And here you have the persistent cost push shock. Okay, now let us consider the case of discretion. So optimal policy under discretion. The central bank cannot keep promises. Uh, they do not commit to a policy plan or to their future actions. And mathematically speaking, we have a sequential optimization problem. So each period we minimize the same objective function subject, of course, to the uh, model equations constraints. And in this simplified case, we basically only have one important constraint that is the uh, new Keynesian Phillips curve. And here um, future expected inflation can actually be seen from uh, the central bank uh, um, as, as given as known, because it is a function of expectations of fu future output gaps, as well as uh, of course future exogenous U, which by assumption cannot be currently influenced by the policymaker. So this whole new ter term here can be taken as given when optimizing this problem. And then one can show that optimality implies something like, um, let's call this a targeting rule that is given a cost push shock. For instance, uh, we get inflationary pressure and the central bank then drives output below its efficient level, creating a ne negative output gap uh, to dampen the rise in inflation. So we have a uh, so-called leaning against the wind policy. Now, what are the Dynair commands to invoke uh, an optimal policy under discretion analysis? Well, basically we also have a planner objective. That is, we have to declare the objective of the policy maker. Um, note though that here we are limited to quadratic objective functions. Okay, so basically we can focus only on variations, variability, variances of the endogenous variables only. So this boils down in a sense to a linear quadratic problem. Basically your model needs to be linear, but your objective is quadratic. So, and then you call the discretionary policy command um, and this computes uh, exactly the approximation to the optimal policy under discretion. This is, as I was saying, the linear quadratic solver. So let's have a look in Dynair how this works. Okay, so let me create a new mode file that I will call so and basically we have the same model. Um, again, I'm only focusing on the cost push shock. Okay, so first let us do a response to a transitory cost push shock under discretion. So we set this parameter to zero. We have to define again the planner objective, um, which is uh, the same. And then I'm simply calling the discretionary policy command um, with the nominal interest rate as instrument. I want to compute IRF, say for 30 periods the planner discount uh, rate here. And I can also uh, change other options like the tolerance level for the optimizer and focus on these three variables. So let's do this. And we have this reaction function here in case of a transitory shock. Let's also consider a persistent shock. Okay. So this is a persistent shock and this is a transitory cost push shock. Now let us compare both uh, cases, the optimal policy under discretion and the optimal policy under commitment and the impulse response function in both cases. For this, I'm simply going to write uh, a simple MATLAB script to have them both in one figure. Okay, so let's first have a look at the transitory cost push shock. 
And here, as you can see under discretion, there is like in, just in period zero, there's the shock, but then it is shut off. So under optimal discretionary policy, the central bank basically only cares about the current value of the cost push process and lets output gap inflation fluctuate proportional to that. But basically the next period it shuts off um, inflation and the output gap immediately. In contrast, the optimal policy under commitment, the deviations from their target value actually persist. And the reason for this is pretty simple. By committing to a policy plan, uh, the central bank manages to improve the output gap inflation trade-off in the period when the shock occurs. So the initial response is smaller. And given the convexity of the loss function that is reducing the deviations in the period the shocks occurs, will then improve uh, welfare. Under discretionary policy, um, the central bank stabilizes the output gap in the medium term more than uh, sh um, she would do under commitment. This is also what we refer to as a stabilization bias. That is to stabilize the output gap in the medium term more than one would do under commitment. Now let's have a look at a permanent cost push shock. Uh, you can also see that there is uh, some asymptotic going back to steady state happening. Nevertheless, under commitment, the initial response under commitment, the initial impact is lower than under discretion. Okay, both for the output gap, but also for inflation, reducing the loss that is reducing the variance of the output gap and the and inflation, um, optimal policy under commitment uh, reduces this uh, better. So to sum up with uh, real rigidities, uh, we have a policy trade-off, okay? We break the divine coincidence. It, it is impossible to achieve both price stability and that output behaves exactly like the natural and efficient output. So the central bank wants to minimize a loss function subject to the equilibrium conditions. And this is then called the Ramsey problem and we solve this either under commitment or under discretion. And we have seen that by committing to some future policy, the central bank is actually able to influence expectations in a way that improves the, those short run uh, trade-offs. And because all our loss function is of course convex, this will improve welfare. On the other hand, under discretion, um, the central bank does not commit itself to any future plans. And we have seen a so-called stabilization bias that it stabilizes output in the medium term more than it should in terms of uh, welfare is um, worse than under commitment. So, but still the question arises, how do we communicate those optimal simple rules based on the natural uh, interest rate on the natural output or on the effective output to a central bank or how to conduct optimal policy in a, in a Ramsey fashion. This is quite difficult because we need to know the, for instance, the real interest rate or the efficient rate of interest. And this requires uh, so much knowledge about the, the true model, the true model param parameters, the realized shocks that, that affect those interest rates, for instance. And we don't have this information, okay? Those are unobservable variables. And, and also uh, talking about Ramsey optimal policy is um, there is no, no clear indication you should do this, you should do more than one to one or something. There is no, no clear uh, indication what a central banker should do. But we can use this of course as a benchmark for something else. Here the literature is looking at simple implementable rules. Let us set up a interest rate rule, a simple one, so a linear one for instance, that only focuses on observable variables. So we can clearly communicate to a central banker when this concept of output gap or this inflation bias is, then you should behave like that. You should behave hawkish, react very strongly to inflation deviations or rather doffish, uh, do a balance re reaction to inflation deviations and output gap deviations. Uh, so we do not require uh, much knowledge of say, for instance, the true parameter values, but we need to come up with um, some evaluation crit criteria. Um, how good is our uh, simple implementable rule compared to some other rule, maybe um, the Ramsey optimal policy under commitment or the um, unobservable optimal simple rule. 
So we need to be able to compare uh, policy regimes. How do we do that? So first we need, of course, um, focus on or select an objective function. And here uh, one can either choose, say, the conditional or unconditional welfare function, which is based on the utility function of the household. So in a sense, this basically boils down whether or not you want to also consider transitional dynamics to the stochastic steady state, uh, because different policies are associated with different stochastic steady states. Um, then if you want to do that, you would rely or you would rather rely on the conditional welfare measure. Um, if you're not concer concerned about this, then you, you can also use the unconditional welfare mean. In this model, we have seen that one could derive um, a, also a loss function by, go, by using a second order approximation to the conditional welfare measure here. This is actually very important to not only do a first order approximation to the welfare, because at first order, the expected value of a variable is always equal to the, the deterministic steady state, whatever choice of policy parameters. So there's no uncertainty um, correction happening there. So if the steady state is uh, independent of the policy, um, welfare will then, of course, not be affected by any any sort of different policy regimes. So going to at least a second order uh, is actually what you want to do uh, to not get those spurious welfare rankings. Um, another way to compare policy regimes is to compute the consumption equivalence. So this is a, a measure uh, to quantify welfare differences between, say, an optimized rule and another rule, uh, some baseline rule. Um, and here I'm, we want to compute the so-called compensating fraction of steady state consumption. How much steady state consumption would be necessary to equate the level of welfare in a baseline scenario? So this is with the uh, index B here, uh, compared to the level of welfare under some alternative scenario, the optimized scenario O, for instance. Since we all often consider additive separable CS utility functions, uh, you can actually do this on paper and then you will get an expression, for instance, like this. Okay, and then when you um, want to compare different policy regimes, well, you should always start at the same initial condition, say for instance, in the deterministic steady state. Again, approximate uh, the model to at least a second order. And then, for instance, you could define a grid of parameters, uh, say the parameters of a simple implementable rule. And then you optimize, um, search those parameters by optimizing the objective, maximizing welfare or minimizing the uh, loss. And in the case of optimal simple implementable rules, the policy instrument is a linear function of just a few variables of the model that are observable and the parameters of the optimal policy, we can then communicate them to policymakers. Of course, there's also a downside here. Um, we have to decide what is the actual policy instrument. And I mean, for monetary policy, this is a very straightforward, but if you consider fiscal policy or macroprudential policy or quantitative easing, this becomes a harder task to do and also what are the variables that actually show up in the policy rule. But, I, but you, of course, can compare different policy rules to each other. So what are the Dynair commands you can, uh, that can help you find those optimal, simple, implementable rules? Um, there is the OSR uh, command, which computes those optimal, simple policy rules for those linear quadratic problems. So the idea is choose a subset of model parameters to minimize the uh, weighted covariance of a subset of endogenous variables under the constraint that the model uh, follows a linear law of motion. This is a linearized model. So OSR is again solving a linear quadratic problem. You have a quadratic loss function and you combine this with a first order approximation to the model's equilibrium conditions. Now gamma are those parameters uh, to be optimized. This is the subset of parameters you, you want to focus on. Y are the endogenous variables, um, U are exogenous variables, and W is the weighting matrix here. So uh, you declare those uh, gamma parameters with OSR params, and you can also declare some bounds with OSR params bounds. And you can then focus actually on, say you only want to minimize inflation and output gap variances, then you can give them weights uh, and all other variables get a weight of zero.
Okay, so you can attach weights to certain variables to really focus on these uh, covariances there. I'm using the uh, uh, Nukangian model with a cost push process, putting the kappa again as a, as a local parameter. I'm introducing feedback um, parameters to the Taylor rule because I'm introducing the Taylor rule again. Okay, so this is observable inflation, okay, and actual output, uh, log deviation, of course, is also observable. And let us just focus on, again, the cost push shock. Let's do this calibration here. This will then be used as initial values. And I want to really focus on uh, inflation and output. So I'm giving those uh, the weight of one. Of one. This is my determines my weighting matrix. Uh, the parameters are the ones from the Taylor rule. And I'm also imposing some bounds here and then OSR computes the um, optimal simple rule coefficients. And also the, so let us do this. In here you have the impulse response functions. And clearly now there is a trade-off between stabilizing output and stabilizing inflation uh, because the out output gap here is non-zero. And these are the parameters that were used to compute these impulse response functions. Uh, in my experience, you always have to play around with the bounds, play around with the optimization algorithms and the options here, and really compare what this implies for the variance you want to minimize. Okay, that's it. Please leave your comments below so I can update the description if I made any mistakes. Have a good one.